course. Okay. Welcome, everyone, to this episode where we talk with some of the now confirmed best debaters in Europe. I am joined with Kira and Hamza from the London School of Economics. Welcome very much. You are not just the first breaking team, but I'm also speaking with the top speaker in Europe, as well as another top 10 speaker in Europe, uh, as well as the open semi-finalist of the European University Debating Championships that was held online just last week. Congratulations. How does it feel to have accomplished what you've accomplished? Um, one, thank you for having us. Um, and second, um, I think we were definitely really surprised to do as well as we did, especially considering that six months ago, we had no idea what debating on a laptop is like. Mm -hmm. So I think just in terms of debating on an online medium and for the majority of our prep being very distant from each other, so not being in the same country, much less the same space meant that it was definitely the sort of thing that we were going into not knowing what would happen. So all things considered, we're actually quite happy. Yeah, definitely. It was a bit surreal because it's so different to Euros we've been to in the past. Um, yeah, exciting though. Yeah. <laughs> very good, yeah. So you mentioned that uh, this was a very surprising moment for you. How did that then feel during the tournament? So by day three, you are sitting confidently in the most challenging rooms of the competition, beating against other, other teams, and still being in control, winning quite a few of those debates. Did you grow into the tournament as well? Did you always feel like you were a bit on your toes? Hmm. I, I think two things changed. So one, we got very attuned to each other's strengths and weaknesses, which sounds like atrociously cliche, but it's true. We just realized I didn't have to listen to Kira's speech to know what she would miss. And she didn't have to listen to my speech to know what she has to weigh, for instance. So it just became so intuitive for us to speak with each other that we were in a very good comfort zone. And I guess the second thing that Kira was actually chatting about with me at, during Euros is how easy it is to disconnect from the debates once you sort of log out from your laptop. Because one of the things that gets to you is pressure and pressure is social, right? So you're always around people at a physical tournament. You're always chatting with them. They want to know how you did. The judges who judged you are having a drink with you at the same time. So it's a very different experience. So this allowed us to really detox the moment the debates ended. Yeah, I agree. I think in that in the top rooms, we hit our stride because we weren't surrounded by all the anxiety and it was easier to kind of just channel the excitement um, rather than being caught up in a lot of nerves. So yeah, no, I, th I think we... We got into the right mindset, basically, to allow that to happen. Very good. So as you mentioned, of course, during a physical tournament, there's a lot of like relaxing or, or, or destabilizing going on. Um, did you have some of that still in the environment you were at? We saw that you were debating outside of the London School of Economics. Was, were the rest of the teams there? Where afterwards you were able to catch a drink on the park or anything? Or did you just go home and relax? I, I yeah. want to make this sound dramatic, but we debated there because we didn't have good Wi-Fi. And I wanted to smoke. So those were two primary motivations for why we debated outside. Yeah, Hamza smoking during debates makes his speeches so much better. So to be honest, you can maybe accredit being best speaker in Europe exactly. to being able to smoke in debates. Right. Um, but yeah, no, so between rounds, because we were at LSE, we went to like, you know, the pub and the coffee shops that we go to during the week all the time. We sat in the park that we go to all the time, which I think helped us keep calmer um, and more focused because it felt more familiar. Um, yeah, so yeah, it, it's just a very different psychological experience to yeah. getting wild off in an unfamiliar environment, you know. But like also in a strange way, we had like a home ground advantage without, mm. like the Euros is technically in another country. But for all means and purposes, we were speaking on our home ground because we're sitting outside the buildings that we know, the coffee shops that we can go to. So that I think really helped. Yeah, I think because we both just graduated as well, it was kind of a nice feeling to be able to go back and do something there. Yeah. And um, so it added an, another element to the tournament, I guess. Very wonderful. I will like tell that this video is not for kids to make sure that the smoking comment doesn't pass. Yeah. What was the <laughs> no worries? What's the what was the best round for you? Like, is was that round perhaps videotaped as well? So when did you feel most at ease and most like you were in control of what you wanted to do? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, that's actually difficult because um, in all honesty, Kira and I read each other really well but we're very honest about our weaknesses in reading debates so there will be debates where we will come out saying we killed it and then lose it immediately <laughs> and there will be debates where we think we did terribly and get a clear first so keeping that caveat in mind i think my personally favorite round was round h so this was uh, a round about how whether occupied people within a country should resist the occupier or support the occupier and one, because of lived experiences, but secondly, I just had so much to say there. 
and we came out of that debate feeling really confident so that was my favorite round yeah Did i agree, agree? I, yeah i agree and i think as well because it was round eight and we felt like you know, we'd done well, we were happy with our case. It was one of these debates where we were OG and Hamza did like a really smart case pivot in his second speech. So I was watching it like, whoa, this is so clever. We didn't even prep this and he's like killing it. And so because we were in that kind of happy vibe from such a good round, going into round nine, which is, you know, the, the most stressful round in any international. And we were we were on such a high already. Um, so yeah, I think I think that made it better. Yeah, I think I've also never been in a position at any international before where we knew we were going to break before the rounds ended. So by round eight, it was, we had a certain number of points without getting into the maths of it, where we were sure that even if you take the fourth in both round eight and round nine, we're breaking. So I've just never gone into a round with that level of confidence, which probably helps. Yeah. And then we were like, you know, we can have fun with this. We're going to yeah. focus on giving good speeches exactly. rather than the whole, like, we just need to, you know, get strategic seconds or strategic thirds. And um, so we were able to lean into that more, which is really fun. Okay, fantastic. So you mentioned that six months ago, you weren't sure that this was going to happen. We None of us were sure during the coronavirus uh, outbreak. Yet you, you eventually you, you learned that this was going online and that meant that you needed to start preparing for it. So tell me, how did you prepare? Did you have like regular Zoom calls, a elaborate Google Doc with all the world's conflicts that you wanted to read up on? Or did you just already knew due to years of practice that you kind of knew your thing, you just needed to just keep on doing what you were doing? Um, the first thing is that Hamza's brain is our massive Google Doc because he just remembers facts like nothing else. So we didn't formalize it online, but we, he did lots of reading and remembers everything. And we did a lot of Zoom calls. I think the first thing we did was sign up to lots of online tournaments. Like we did a, an insane number of yeah. online tournaments yeah. um, because it, getting used to the format was very different. So like from April, I think is when we started because we knew we were going to do Euros by then. And then the first one was a bit weird, but then after that it felt more normal. And then it just felt like kind of normal tournament prep. Um, realistically and um, so yeah just practicing debating online I think was the biggest thing we had to focus on to prep because that was a big adjustment especially when we weren't physically together like I find it really frustrating prepping with him on call and it's just hard to like communicate during rounds um, so that was kind of the biggest hurdle to overcome which is just I think all you can do is practice in that kind of situation yeah and I think we never really prep motions on call and I think a lot of teams do this but what we do instead is that we discuss motions which is very different from prepping arguments for them so if there's a motion let's say about uh, nationalizing or breaking up big banks instead of thinking of arguments for or against we would just be like why did this motion come up how does this interact with the real world um, what are the themes in this debate? So we chatted about a lot of motions, but you never really prepped any. And I think that really helped us like have a slightly more strategic aerial overview of debates in cases where we definitely needed to have that. Yeah, I think as well. So we prepped with other LSE debaters who we also a big thank you to. And it's just interesting because um, even when you're not prepping sides of emotion, Hamza and I had very different intuitions about debates from the intuitions of other people we were speaking with. So just kind of discussing debates like as people rather than as someone competing in open government gave us a really, it, it made me think much more strategically about debates because I realized that my intuitions aren't what other people's intuitions are even though in a set position, we would make the same arguments, if that makes sense. So we, yeah, we use Zoom calls, but I think Hamza's right. We just chatted about debates more than doing like formulaic prep. Although obviously we still practice because that's really important, but that wasn't our like sole focus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so Hamza, you're mentioned now as the, basically the walking encyclopedia of the team. Is it something you actively worked on or are you just interested in uh, learning more? How did that develop? Um, so I, I also, uh, coach kids and there's often a question about how do you basically, basically the broader question, how do you process information for debating? And I think my answer is that information is everywhere if you're looking for it. So for instance, I'll be honest, um, a lot of the information I extrapolate for from debating comes from movies, fictional books, video games, cartoons, um, but a lot of it also comes from reading the news. But I think the first step a lot of people miss because they tend to think of some things as entertainment and some things of, as in terms of information, even though for many means and purposes, they're the same. So I think I just retain things, one, but two, I just make sure that I get information from wherever I get it. So for instance, if I have a chat outside school with someone, which is a very by the way conversation, three weeks later, it might be relevant in a debate. So you just have to always be, it's almost having a, it's like, you know how you have an anthropol, a sociologist's eye, you're looking at everything from sociological lens. I think you have a debater's eye, so-called, where whenever you get information, like, oh, that's interesting. And then you sort of put it into your file cabinet mentally, making sure it can come up whenever it needs to. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll readily admit here that even though I haven't spoken competitively in maybe two or three years, this habit for me has unfortunately stuck on where yeah. I am reading something random and then probably think, oh, that's a good idea for emotion. Or I would run this as an argument somewhere. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, still sometimes do too much with my brother-in-law. <laughs> <But> okay. <laughs> Kiara, yeah. what what specifically did you want to bring to the team uh, and, and help and help with? Um, and how did you make sure that those strengths were uh, uh, strengthened? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So I think Hamza and I have very different strengths and we complement each other quite a lot because he knows lots of things. He's also very good at case construction, coming up with arguments, coming up with cases, which is genuinely less my strength. I'm good at the kind of how to make arguments, how to fill holes in arguments, like the more kind of nitty bitty aspect of debating. Um, so how do you prove something? Whereas Hamza comes up with the big claims. Um, so for me, I guess I was, the way we work in prep is Hamza will say, you know, here are my ideas, here's the things we should prove. And then I kind of filter out and say, okay, here are the specific ways in which we should do this. So I'm kind of like, I filter his big ideas and then turn them into like, you know, debate mechanisms or specific reasons. Um, so a lot of what I was doing, I guess, is just practicing with Hamza because I don't have the creativity that he has, but I have a lot of the kind of debate instincts. So a lot of it was just practicing together so that I could complement the things that he was doing in prep and in debates as well. Um, yeah, and especially because I spoke first, Hamza would have these kind of big ideas and big claims, which I always really enjoyed getting to work with because they're fantastic. And then because I was first, my job was to kind of go through it with the lens of like filtering it and making sure it was very well proven and very methodical, um, which is something that I think is more my strength. So I think my answer to that question is basically the main thing I want to do is just capitalize on the things that I'm good at, that Hamza wasn't as good at, and then practice that um, through working together. Even structuring things, because I have a like, stream of consciousness way of uh, conversation and also debate prep. So I would randomly bring in um, aliens and then Obama and then the World Cup in the same sentence. And then Kira has to piece together what fits where. <laughs> so you have an actual argument as opposed to just uh, blabber. So. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, I, I had something similar going on with my partners uh, back in the day. I was I mostly took the Hamza role in terms of like coming up with all the ideas, uh, and my partners uh, tried to be more critical of it, but also sometimes got a bit bored. So then got the spirit, the energy going up by making sure that after a minute ten we started gossiping about whatever happened to our friends uh, yeah. if we found emotion to be a bit too boring. You mentioned that there was also some you you, you were very good in, and you show you're very good at showcasing the strengths and weaknesses of your team. So when you started prepping, were you thinking of, we need to specifically tackle this weakness or build on this strength? Like, how did you decide what you wanted to focus on during your preparation? Hmm. Yeah. I think the, the first thing to say is that before we started Euros, we'd already done Worlds together in 2019. We'd done a few competitions. So by this point, we were quite familiar. But I think we knew that in terms of executing speeches, both of us generally do quite well. We generally don't miss obvious links. Um, but the thing sometimes we were doing is like proving the wrong things or like running cases that were too ambitious or too narrow or were interesting but didn't really fit in the debate. So the main thing that we wanted to do was have a more strategic overview of choosing arguments. Um, and that's why we spent more time like talking about debates rather than practicing speeches. Um, but that, that just comes from us having gotten so much feedback where judges are saying, you know, you're, you're giving really good speeches. You're just slightly missing the mark of what you need to be doing. Yeah. I don't know if you have a different. Yeah, I, I think that's true. But I think... Uh... No strength is a strength and no weakness is a weakness because they're just attributes and then attributes can be in the positive and the negative. So are you too fast or too slow? Doesn't matter because the other person needs to know so that we can capitalize on it. So any weakness is a strength, any strength is a weakness depending on whether you capitalize on it. I think we were very consciously having this conversation in a way that I actually think made up for our individual faults compared to other speakers at the tournament where we might not be individually as good, but as a team, we were just so conscious of what the other person does, not does wrong or right, because again, it's about capitalizing. So for instance, uh, Kira can get through analysis very rapidly. Now, just knowing this is really important because this means I have to frame because I don't have to construct. She can give three speakers case in one speech, which means all of my speech is now about framing. And then for me, it's the flip where Kira knows that I am a bit slow and my rebuttal can sometimes be a bit glim. So she knows that I will work on the framing, but she has to work on the rebuttal. So I think often the problem with teams is that they think of something as a weakness and then try to change it. We never did that. We, were ne we never went that far. We were just like, this is just how the two of us speak. How can we mesh together this combination to make it work? 
Okay, I, th I think that is an excellent way to look at it. And it also shows you've been partners for quite a while now. So that, that, that definitely shows that it's, it's helpful to keep speaking with someone. I'm wondering, I guess most people who are listening into this are also just wondering, how do you get towards someone who manages to break the worlds or euros? So how did you feel, feel a little bit further that you managed to make the step up where you became, say, a breaking speaker? What were the things that started clicking for you and how did you make them click? Okay, I'll, I'll go first. Um, so I think I had uh, a slightly unique experience coming to LSE. One, because I had been at world school, so I had some limited experience in competitive debating. And secondly, I had the great fortune of being programmed by, or at the time, two of the circuit's best debaters. So I came in on paper winning two tournaments, but those tournaments were won by people who were probably going to win worlds if they spoke. So, so I, I came in not feeling a break was particularly valuable because I just sat there while they said things and then I got the break. But I mean, you guys had probably a different experience. Um, yeah, so I think, I think when you start debating or when you've been doing it for a while, everyone kind of gets to this rut where you're like, not breaking but you're like good enough such that you kind of understand the game you understand the rules but it's kind of frustrating to get over that and it sounds I think the way in which I did it I think firstly I think it's a lot of resilience because I think a lot of people get very disheartened when it gets to the point where you're just missing the break quite consistently or you're getting the same speaks over and over and it's very very easy to at that point get very frustrated get very disillusioned and then not keep putting in the effort and having the drive that it takes to get much better so I honestly think the main difference is it's kind of psychological it's being able to keep staying as motivated and keep working as hard even in points where the results aren't showing because we I think we do have this kind of fallacy where we think that debate progress is like linear like you, you know you get better at the same rate but I like for us certainly I got the red like bits where something just clicked in my head and then I got much better and then I like forgot the other things I was doing and got worse for a bit and then I stayed the same for a bit and then I jumped up again and um, so it's basically like patience and resilience to stay as motivated and stay doing specific prep things despite the fact that you might not be getting the results that you want which is important um I think the second thing I guess in making the transition is like the realization that so you know debaters tend to have lots of thoughts about the world um very interesting ideas but you kind of have to have the realization that just like lots of people know better than you do like your partner probably knows better in a lot of instances the judges definitely know better in most instances the other teams in the room know better but you have to realize that so that you respond to them properly so that you absorb feedback so that you listen to your partner and i think when that clicks and then you realize how much there is to gain from the people around you. That's the point at which you can capitalize on that and then make a big jump in improvement rather than just focusing on your own arguments and your own thoughts, because you're, you're not going to become like a breaking speaker yeah. and an amazing speaker if you just think very insularly. So I guess using the resources around you, judges, partners, teams, and learning from them and having that mindset all the way through is what I think makes the, makes the jump. Yeah, and I would say this is particularly true for either people who are just going into university debating, having prior debating experience or people who are academically very successful in high school because they come in with the intuition that if I'm good at class presentations or even world schools debating, I'm just going to uh, like beat every person on the circuit and be best speaker in six months time. And that's really hard to do. So I just think making sure that you're self-reflective and self-aware and know that you're coming into a new circuit with new barometers and new standards and new experiences is really important. I think I think that this is actually a very good answer because it indeed deals far more with the mindset, which I think is very useful because everyone's skills, as you earlier pointed out, uh, is unique and everyone has different capacities and backgrounds. But that mindset, I think, is the thing that combines it all. Very, very interesting. Are there any things that you're currently seeing on the circuit, like the type of arguments people are making or strategic approach people are making that you're saying, these are things that I want to highlight, these are things that people are doing well, or these are things that maybe it would be helpful if people started unlearning them uh, because it might impede progress for these people? That's interesting. interesting. Um, I think I have obvious biases and so and they're fairly reflective in my speeches for anyone who's ever watched them. So I've always thought British parliamentary debating should be much closer to public speaking and declamation than it is now, because I do think that for better or for worse, the moral suasion of a speech often comes from how emphatically it is said and not just with the logical content of what you're saying, because Otherwise, it would just become an academic conference where we're submitting logically coherent and conceptually congruent papers, right? So, so I definitely think that more needs to be done in terms of making sure that there are stylistically great speakers out there. I think Euros did a reasonable, goodly good job of that by introducing this uh, a brilliant speech award where it's supposed to reward people 
who do do that sort of thing. And I think the reason it's important is not just because it's nice to watch and because it makes explicit a standard which exists anyway. But I think that's what a lot of people want from debating because when people step into debating, no one thinks that they're going to debunk premises and further claims. They come in thinking, I'm going to be a debater. And their depiction of a debater is someone who has confidence, assertiveness, can own the floor, can deliver points with a sense of style that they didn't before. So I think focusing on that aspect helps everyone both inside and outside debating. Also just makes it more accessible. Like it's hard to even convince my best friends to watch a debate right now because it's just <laughs> lots of people speaking really fast and talking about comparatives, et cetera, for seven minutes. But when it becomes more publicly digestible, I think that makes the debating community less insular. Yeah, and I think to, to people who don't resonate with that. So for me, I've always, even when I did world schools and in school it was so fast and everyone has been telling me for years to this day, you know, slow down, be comprehensible, like sound nicer. Um, but I've managed to get to a stage where, you know, I can speak clearly and then this is my weakness, but I have a partner who, you know, gives amazingly rhetorical speeches that are really engaging and capitalizes on that strength. So also don't get disillusioned. Um, I think follow Hamza's advice, but don't get disillusioned if you feel like you can't have that skill set, basically. Um, because listening to that, I would be, I would be like, no, that's not me. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think, I think that's fair. Um, yep. Any other trends? I'm thinking. Um, I, I think the one thing that I actually like, I mean, this was sort of brought on by the unfortunate pandemic, but just the online stuff has maximized access so much. So, for instance, uh, a couple of the tournaments that happened the run up to Euros had teams speaking from Bangladesh, had teams speaking from India, had teams speaking from Pakistan, uh, from elsewhere, because they could now, because it's hard to speak European tournaments otherwise. One, the reg fee trivially was much lower because um, it's online, but two, just the cost of a visa, the cost of flying, taking time out. So I think online tournaments, irrespective of uh, how well we get through all of what's happening, should stay in some form because I think the amount of access and development they provide to speakers across the world is a fantastic thing. I think to, to link this back to the question about trends in like in specific debates, I think the things that we've noticed is that it's much harder to do that now because we're not just competing against people from Iona like we usually would be. We're competing against teams from Europe and the States and Asia. Um, and everyone has such different ways of judging debates that I think actually one of the biggest challenges that we haven't said yet, but in this Euros prep season was getting feedback from judges with such different preferences and just judging different judging parameters that it's much hard now to have like broad trends and um, because in the tournaments we've done it's much more mixed between people of different circuits and um, so I guess that makes it even more important that you're just listening to judges and making your style as kind of generalizable as possible um, because you have to appeal to a wide range of judges whereas we got very caught up in like what the London judges like which is very different to what a lot of other judges like um, so I guess be more aware of that yeah um, is something I'd say. Okay, that, that does a wonderful. I, I, I agree with a lot of the things you're saying about the style, just giving two observations. So when I started out debating, so when I was a fresher at university back in the old days of 2011, uh, the best speaker at the time was someone called Catherine Murphy, who now starts also as a comedian in the, in the London circuit. And she spoke fast. But she spoke very articulate. And there are, I think, definite different ways in which you are able to speak in your own style and make that come true. But I think also, as Hamza pointed out correctly, is stylistical speeches are, I think, also more persuasive and impactful. I've, I think, sat down at least seven rounds at, when I was judging the European Championships where teams were missing that final link of proving why I like ought to care about that impact. So, like people just come to the point where they say, here's like actor X and actor X is important for this round. And I'm like, okay, I, I believe you, but I also have like three other teams who are telling me that there's like another group that I need to care about as well. And making that final link probably helps a lot of you make just that group sound persuasively important as a sort of like missing brick to make it on. So I think that's a very interesting thing to, to highlight as well. Um, so obviously you've had, of course, some benefits from being like in the London scene. You point out the online debating is important there as well. Um, but for people who want to emulate some part of your success, what are the tips you would give them that they could do with their own club? So what makes LSE great and what could other people learn from LSE? Hmm. Um, so, so Kira was president of the LSE Debate Society, so she might be perhaps better positioned to answer this. But I think the only thing I'll say is that uh, the LSE Debate Society is often joined by a lot of people, because not because of its debating, but because of other things. And I think that's fantastic because we almost rope people in with our friendliness where it's, um, you know, why don't you come in, you'll make a bunch of friends, we'll go for picnics, we'll go for ice cream. And what that means is that you have then a massive pool of people. 
and then whoever is interested competitively can sort of come in and step into those shoes but irrespective you still stake enjoyment in the art of the sport so that's something i really liked about the great side yeah and we learn a lot from people who aren't you know as competitive debaters but have a lot of insights and knowledge on topics which i've helped yeah no i agree i think the thing that i would say kind of about training specifically is the approach that we've always done at lse um, which I think is really important, is like you need to train yourself to debate by separating out different skills um, rather than just doing lots of practice debates and feedback and doing the same thing over and over. So Joe, who used to be our training officer, um, had this, I thought, a really great analogy where he's like sports teams don't just practice by playing matches. They do, you know, they practice dribbling, they practice scoring, they practice shooting. And in the same way, the way we've always structured training at LSE is, you know, you you learn about characterization and then you do drills on that. You learn about framing and you do some drills on that. You learn about case construction and you do some drills on that. So think about debate skills individually, helps you build them up such that when you put them together in speeches, I think it's a lot more powerful. Because I think a lot of, you need to kind of be strategic in the way that you spend time preparing. And doing debates is obviously really important because you should get practice. But I do think that the thing which LSU training helped me develop the most was that it forced me to be like, okay, you know, this week you're going to focus on this this specific skill in these ways. And then in the debate, only focus on that skill and make sure you're doing that really well, rather than always trying to do everything perfectly. Um, because then you never you never focus on specific specific skills, if that makes sense. So I think that's the approach, which I would say was really powerful. Yeah, and in terms of organizing training, I, I don't know who precisely is watching this, but I'm going to assume it's people not from LSE, for instance, just, just so that I can give some advice that's applicable to people outside LSE. Don't be afraid of asking people from other universities for help. So I think one of the things that we did, and no matter which country you're in, if you know that there's a bunch of good debaters out there outside your school or university, email them, Facebook message them, chances are they will help. But I think one of the things that we did in the last two years especially was that we used to invite speakers to come in and give training. So for instance, if someone is really good at philosophy motions, you would bring in that person for a philosophy lecture. If someone is really good at framing and we've seen them on the circuit, we bring them in for framing. So just don't balkanize yourself um, in the debating community. 100% uh, people will say yes. They are flattered. They want to come in. They want to help. And especially like debating in the time of Corona, you have you have digital connections, right? So for instance, even if you ask myself and Kira yeah. to give a session to some school on the other side of the world, we would likely help because it's just a laptop. So. <laughs> definitely reach out. Fantastic. Do you also think that online resources are a useful alternative? Like, have you ever watched like debate videos people give these lectures and have they been of use to you? Oh, 100%. Yeah, yeah, lots of them. Yeah, the EUDC training platforms, every year they've done it, very, very useful videos. And what we've always done is I think I had a problem where I used to watch, you know, debate lectures just very passively, or sometimes I'd take notes, but then I wouldn't think about it after. So what Hamza and I did is we'd always, either one of us would watch the video and then explain it to the other, and they would kind of challenge us on that knowledge to make sure we understood it, or we'd both watch it, and then we'd discuss it after to say, you know, what are the implications? What can we learn from this? Are there bits we disagree with? Because you're allowed to disagree with, like, top debaters, people have different opinions. Um, how would we apply this in rounds? Um, and I think make sure that you're you're critically analyzing their debate resources as opposed to just like assuming that everything that top debaters say is the word of god because we all have different you know i have a very different approach to hamza they're both they're both legit it just depends which one fits you more so definitely be critical when you're absorbing debate resources and then actively use them so either do a round straight after where you just focus if you watch for example if you watched uh you watched a lecture on rebuttal do a debate where you're like my goal is to give really good rebuttal and i don't care about anything else i'm just going to give rebuttal so that you're focusing on that skill um or discuss it just make sure that you're a being critical and then b actively using the resource rather than just passively consuming it um because otherwise you spend a lot of time and it's just not very efficient like i've wasted a lot of hours watching videos on anything like debate things or information things which then i didn't actually use in critique and didn't help me so definitely you make the most of resources but make sure you're actively participating in it i guess i would say yeah, and I, I think when you're in cyberspace, there's no fine line between uh, online debate resources and other things. Like, I, I, I'll keep hammering in the, on this point. Like, if you go on Facebook and someone posts something about TikTok, I am very serious when I say there's chances that this could come up at some point in a debate. And I think it's also our style of argumentation. Argumentation is often deeply personal. So argumentation is often, what would this person in this war zone think? What would this person, the feminist movement think? What would this person, this occupied country think? And I think those intuitions don't come from just watching debates or reading articles or reading research papers. It just comes from thinking about debating with human sensibilities, which, which I know is counterintuitive to the exercise, but I think is quite important. 
because then you do one you win in an instrumental sense but do you make arguments which sound true not just are true if that makes sense so look at the world around you there's stuff to learn there online that is fantastic advice to maybe close up with and um, is there one more thing that you'd like to say that you think is very important for people wanting to enjoy debating or improve debating uh, that they think you should take that with you from this conversation Hmm. So I, I think there's two things that uh, are, are probably really uh, important to chat about. So one would just be have friends on the circuit. I just think that's important because it's not just about winning and losing. It's generally that for the vast majority of people I know, either all of their, most of their friends are debaters or if not, they were debaters at some point. So often it's not just people who you meet on a weekly basis. It's someone that you just happened to meet at some tournament abroad. And now you're really close with them. So definitely don't think of debating as just a competitive opportunity, but it's also a social and very personal opportunity to engage with people because it takes a very specific sort of person to spend weekends shouting at people. So chances are that you guys are like-minded. So I think you'll make good friends. Um, but I think the second thing I'll say is, and I, I actually think we don't do this enough and we've been chatting about how some teams do, and this is often teams that we're surprised that they're doing this because once you get into the winning mentality, it's all about, did we win the round? But I think one of the things that I saw some teams do at Euros and at tournaments previous is they would run something really interesting and then come out and just want to chat about the motion, mm -hmm. which, which, which sounds so rare, like, like chatting about things in a personal intellectual sense, like is a, is like endangered on a debating circuit because it's all about the winning argument as opposed to what though this was really interesting actually. So I think that's the second thing I would say that like you have this unique opportunity to sit around people who are reasonably smart individuals talking about reasonably contentious topics. So take that opportunity very seriously, not just in a competitive sense, but also in a personal intellectual sense, you'll learn something. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think we've always said that if you're only debating because you enjoy winning, it's a really bad reason to debate. Um, so just make sure you are enjoying it and you're doing it because it brings you fulfillment and satisfaction and challenges you rather than just focusing on results because, you know, you're, you're definitely going to lose at some point. We all lose at some point. So you kind of need to make sure that you're, you're invested for those reasons. Um, I think just the last thing I'd say is just like perseverance and self-belief are so critical to being able to do well. Like, so, so Hamza and I have both had an experience where, so I, I didn't break at Mexico Worlds. And then what, seven months later, I was in the open final of Euros. I hope you don't mind me saying this, but Hamza didn't break at Thailand Worlds literally this year. And now he's best speaker in Europe, like only a few months later. So it's the thing, like if we got disillusioned and if we'd taken that as, you know, a hit on ourselves, it would have been really hard to pick up, but there, you're always able to get better. Um, and you're always able to use failures as a, a positive learning opportunity, which we both did because we both learned things from these experiences, which made us be much better at the next Euros because we knew what we had to work on. We were more motivated. So, so much of it was about mindset and self-belief, I think is a nice note to end on. Yeah, I think I'll just say that if you can somehow manage to not break at the World Championships and then be best speaker of Europe, then anything is possible. So In the same the, year, in the same year. That's the whole <laughs> I want to end on. Fantastic. Thank you so much. You are now graduated, I heard. So what is next for you two? Um, so I'm starting work at the Treasury in September. Um, yeah, I'm excited. I, after a series of things to do with Trump's executive orders and the coronavirus, have finally decided to go to the LSE for a master. So I'm in London for the year. Okay, wonderful. So we might be seeing all of you back, maybe looking for some spicy Treasury financial motions from Kira. Yes, I'll have spike yeah. knowledge now. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, good luck with the rest of your future debates and non-debate careers. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Us. Yeah, good luck to everyone watching this. Thank you.